Hi guys and welcome back to Sony Pod. So today we have a very special guest indeed. You may recognise him from Sky Sports, but more importantly, he's a massive Sunderland fan. Tom White, welcome. How are you? Very well, thank you. Great to be here. Good, lovely, lovely. So how have you been finding life without football or for the majority of lockdown? How have you been finding life? Uh, it's been all right for me, to be honest, because I've still been working, so I haven't had that, haven't had that problem. Um, and but not as much as usual, so still being able to have a bit of a rest. I've yeah. missed football a lot. I'm glad that the Premier League and and, and such like is back. Mm-hmm. Devastated that that League One was curtailed for obvious reasons. Um, it would have been would have been nice to finish the season. I wasn't feeling particularly confident about our chances anyway. No, but the heck of a lot of times when I felt like mm-hmm. we've, we were definitely getting relegated from the Premier League, and we ended up staying up. Yeah, so I could easily have been proved wrong. So, um, shame about that. I have missed the football, but actually, lockdown for me, thankfully, touch wood, has actually been been all right. Yeah, uh, that was actually going to be one of my questions that you just touched upon. Then, um, so of course, with the season abruptly ending in the way that it did, um, me myself, like you just mentioned, I don't believe we would have gone up, unfortunately, uh, with the form that we were in. So I was going to say. Of course, do you think we would have gone up? And if not, why? I don't think we were... I actually just don't think we were playing well enough at a, at a crucial time of the season. And when we went into the break, everyone around us had games in hand on us. We'd just yeah. taken one point out of the last two games. That that uh, last-minute goal that Gillingham scored against us was it ended up being yeah. <laughs> a heck of a lot more important than we thought at the time. Bristol Rovers... Because I went to that Bristol Rovers game and that was the last game before lockdown, not that we knew that at the time, we were so bad in that game that yeah. I thought, I don't think we're even going to make the playoffs here. Now, we could have easily turned that round. And I think it, I would have probably felt 50-50 as to whether we would make the playoffs or not. I don't think we're going to make the top two. No. no. Um, and, and had we made the playoffs, you never know. So that there was that absolute... Like really, it was very hurtful to find out that we weren't going to have that chance yeah. to finish the season. I wasn't feeling particularly confident, but like I said, I've been lacking in confidence before. Yeah, we've pulled off, so I wasn't completely feeling down and out. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I was I was going to mention um, the way in which the season had finished. Obviously, on the points per game, um, I've mentioned before in previous videos, of course we were never going to come up with a solution that suited everyone, that everyone's going to be happy with it. That was always going to be a very difficult um, uh, solution to come up with. But does it not anger you somewhat that there were teams within the playoffs that said that they didn't want to play uh, the the remainder of the games, of course, because of the uh, health and safety reasons, yet they are more than happy to play in the playoffs, if that makes sense? Yeah. Now, I agree. If you say... If you say, right, I'm not feel, I don't feel comfortable finishing the season, then yes, you shouldn't be allowed to play in the playoffs. But it actually wouldn't have affected the vote. The vote was so far in favour of yeah. against playing, that even if those four clubs currently in the playoffs and the ones who've gone up in the top two, even if they voted to continue the season, mm-hmm. the vote would still be, have gone against finishing Absolutely. the season. So mm-hmm. It wouldn't have actually mattered, but yes, I do agree. If you vote to say that it's not safe to finish, yeah. um, you shouldn't be able to play. However, were they really voting to say it's not safe to finish, or were they voting to say financially it's going to cripple us? Yeah, no, and that's, that's very case, true. And 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 that's an, another side, another side to it as well. My my, my biggest issue was with I felt that the I don't know the EFL have never told us what they tried to do to financially get the season finished. Because mm-hmm. every club, every player at every club, every staff member would have had to have uh, two coronavirus tests a week. Yeah. Right? Now that would have cost a fortune. And the clubs, I understand that the clubs simply couldn't pay that. There's no way they could possibly budget for that no. at the start of the season. Now, what did the EFL do? Did the EFL look into their own bank account and say, can we fund this to finish mm-hmm. the season, given that the government is saying it's safe to do so? Um, 
have they? It's, it's all. It's it's far too easy to just say, "Oh, the Premier League will pay for it." But did they yeah. actually ask the Premier League? And of course, one option was the PFA. Did they ask the PFA? Because if the players were all saying, "We want to play," mm-hmm. then the PFA could could step in. Mm-hmm. But I don't know if the EFL actually tried to get this funding or whether they just yeah. said, "Tell you, you lot decide." And if they did say that, I'm not particularly happy about that. But I don't know. They may have exhausted all of their options and realised they couldn't help. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's a difficult one, absolutely. And, and like, like you say, it's, uh, it's circumstances no one could have ever predicted. And uh, in, in terms of teams that, of course, about we not to play, and like I say, the majority was heavily against us anyway. Um, but it probably was done tactically from a few. For example, Wickham, we were in front of them and of course they leapfrogged us and I think if we were in their position, we would we would we would have done the same, wouldn't we? I'd like to think we wouldn't have done the same actually, because no. we've said throughout that we could afford to we, that we could afford to carry on the season. Yeah, and we we can't say um, like us us and Peterborough can't say this is goes against all integrity of oh. sport, let alone football and League One. This goes against the integrity of sport. If if we then said. Yeah, but if it was the other way around, we would have voted to, to end the season. No, absolutely. I think we would actually think we, I'd, I'd like to think anyway, yeah, that we would have voted to carry on the season anyway. It, it, and I, I think that, in fairness to Peterborough, I think Peterborough would have, and I hope we would have too. Yeah, I, I believe obviously morally that it, it, it's wrong, and I, I just I suppose I try and look at it from their standpoint that you can kind of understand why they would go down that route or try and appreciate uh, their sort of tactic or tactic, their, their, their thinking behind not playing um, as such. I suppose I'm just trying to give them a little bit of leeway because I think it just doesn't sit well with me, like we've just mentioned. It doesn't sit well with me and it does feel a little bit dodgy that they say they don't want to play, yet they're more than happy to play in the playoffs. Yeah, I completely agree with that, and it's um, it's it's what it's it's what's kind of hurt me the most, really. Um, but like I say, I, I just I, I would love to know what the EFL tried to do in yeah. terms of, of helping clubs get through, because let's also remember that now we're going to have gone into our administration, um, they're going to be they are going to be the first of many, yeah. and have the EFL purposely not paid for the testing because they need to keep some money back to help any clubs that might go into administration. Mm-hmm. And, and that may be the, the genius reason why they've saved up all this money. If they're not going to help the clubs go into administration financially, mm-hmm. then have they really done enough to keep football going? No, I guess in, in time we'll find out. And I hope that um, I improved, um, I'm proved wrong in my cynicism. Yeah, well, you, you'd hope so. Um, you, you'd hope so. But um, moving on to maybe... Uh, not so much of a negative, but this season as a whole, how, how how did you find it? What are your thoughts on the season as a whole for Sunderland in particular? Well, last season when we lost in the playoff final, I wasn't as devastated as most because I'd really, really enjoyed the season. Loved yeah. it. it. I mean, when we when we lost in the playoff to Charlton in the championship, it, the four-all game, and we lost on penalties, I was I was quite young, but I remember thinking, this has been a really enjoyable season. We'll do it all again next season. And it was great because we did even better and, and went up with record points. Mm. I, I, I felt the same thing might happen. So because we've ended up not going up, not getting into the playoffs, it's actually, I, I found it very disappointing. Mm. I have enjoyed, as an, as an away fan, I love going to the new grounds. Mm. So there's been a lot, a lot of highs from a fan point of view, just because you have some good day, day outs at away games and, there have been some good performances, but in general, I look back at this um, as a negative. There was the, the there was the talk of the takeover from um, Michael Dell and his group, which was exciting. That in the end didn't didn't come to fruition for whatever reason. Um, the I actually quite liked Jack Ross. Um, he went. Um, and results haven't really improved. Nothing against Phil Parkinson, but things haven't really improved mm. since he's gone. So that hasn't worked out. So the excitement of a new manager hasn't gone our way. No. So all in all, I look back in this season with disappointment. Whereas last season, even though it ended in disappointment, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I can't say that about this season. 
No, I, I absolutely agree. Uh, I think, of course, going down to League One in the first place, that was, of course, a very sad uh, and stressful time. But like you say, we got the new owners in, new manager. And I was, myself, was very excited about Jack Ross, who was a young up-and-coming manager. And we were playing some exciting football. And I felt like we, you know, the, the club had a bit of life breathed back into it again. Um, whereas this season, it just felt like it was just a bit more of a, a hangover and that sort of buzz of being to all these new away grounds that disappeared this season um, quite substantially. Um, but on, on the owners uh, themselves, of course, I've made it known myself. I am massively Stuart Donald out. Um, may I ask your thoughts on the, the owner, the current ownership at Sunderland? Well, I think because Stuart Donald wants out, yeah. then you have to want a change because once an owner doesn't want to be there anymore, mm. then is he or she going to really give it 100% effort that people from anywhere in the Northeast demand? They're probably not, right? That's not a criticism of him at all yeah. and not an accusation that he's not trying at all because he certainly was trying. But if he is actively trying to sell the club, is he going to give it his, is he going to put his heart and soul into it when actually he wants out? So in that case, I am like you, hoping that a takeover does come about. Yeah. It has to be the right takeover. Because I still maintain that I've always got slated for always defending Ellis Short, all right? But yeah. eventually, eventually he gave up. So there had to be a change. Mm -hmm. um, and when Stuart Donald came in, I feel that he was the right man at the time because he did put his heart and soul into it. His intentions were good. I don't mind that he bought the club relatively cheaply in the hope that we get into the Premier League and he'd sell it at a huge profit. I had no problem with that whatsoever yeah. because his time would have been successful. Yeah. And that's probably would have sold the club to someone with billions of pounds. And like we did with Ellis Short, we always had a safety net of that money. So his... I don't, I don't mind his intentions when he took over at all. No. And he was doing all the right things. He cut the costs, which was something I had to do because we were a Premier League club in League One. So mm -hmm. he, he cut the costs. He was, he, he was there. He was going to all of the games. He was actually... He, he, was, he was present at the club. Yeah, of course. But now that he's decided he wants out, mm -hmm. then there has to be a change. Yeah. Okay. So... Did, am I am I chanting Donald out and 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 telling everyone that I dislike Stuart Donald? No, definitely no. not. Mm -hmm. But do I want there to be a takeover? Yes. Yeah. But that's because he wants out. Okay. Well, as long as we get the sound clip of you saying Donald out, we'll be we'll be fine. <laughs> 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 no, no, I, I agree. I mean, uh, it, his original plan, you know, of course, if. It, it, it's a business at the end of the day. If uh, he goes up from League One to the Championship, the Premier League, and he cashed out and made a ton of money for himself, and that's fair enough. As long as we're successful, I don't care what he does with uh, with his money. I think my main sort of gripe at the moment is that he has purchased the club for peanuts and it has evidently been purchased with the club's own money. He's put very little into the club in terms of uh, finances that are adding to the club and the value of the club, yet he seems to be asking for quite a hefty amount of money that for a club that he's paid practically zero into, if that makes sense. Or at well, least it's, that way. It, it's, quite, it's quite normal for a, a new owner to use the club's money, in effect, to, to, buy, the, yeah. to buy the club. Like, like using the parachute payments as, as a sort of um, de deposit, I suppose it would be, for, for, to, yeah. to get it off in the short. That, that is quite normal. And don't forget that the, the figures that have come out recently have, have said that um, Mad Rocks, yeah. Stuart Donald's company, owes Sunderland £20 million. Now, let's say the club is for sale for £30 million, and I don't know the ins and outs, but let's say it's for sale for £30 million. Stuart Donald's already got 20 of that. A new owner comes in and says, right, keep the 20, and here's another 10. There's your £30 million. Even a new owner would be using the club's money Mm -hmm. to buy two thirds yeah. of that 30 million. Yeah. And we wouldn't complain. No. So, no. And we weren't complaining when Donald took over. Um, so it, it's, it's quite complicated in, it's quite complicated in, in that way. 
And yeah. but then again, I don't actually know if he's if the club is for thirty million. Has the price gone down? Yeah, I know. I know that um, people have approached the club and been told that there are bids on the table. Yeah, and, yeah. And I, I, you think right? Is that the club's owners being good business people mm. and or trying to be good business people? And saying there's bids on the table, this is it. So you're gonna to have to be quick and you're gonna to have to match it. Yeah. And calling people's bluff, or are they genuine? And there are these bids on the table, and there's some due diligence being done because the bids that I'm hearing are on the table mm-hmm. are very, very big fees for a club in League One. So yeah. I've got my doubts about it. Yeah. Yeah. But then there are a lot of people who see Sunderland as, mm-hmm. like Stuart Donald did as someone who they can get to the Premier League mm-hmm. and it will be worth five times as much as they pay. Yeah. And, and now, remember, when Stuart Donald took over, there were huge wages. Mm-hmm. All those Premier League wages now have gone. So whoever takes over has got far fewer outgoings than mm-hmm. what they did. Yeah, of course. I, I, absolutely. And I think in an ideal world, we would bring in new owners and moving on to the next topic, which is transfers. If we did, if we were to bring in new owners, um, I don't feel like we'd need to spend a massive amount, particularly in league one. Uh, there are plenty of free agents out there, which I will get on to get onto in a moment as well. But I, I think you only really need, I think with our squad as well, although it is quite bare, you'd probably only need about 5 million uh, throughout this squad. If you really wanted to get a team that was to really um, get, c- control the league, because the, I, th- I think with us, there is a problem uh, that teams do inflate their prices massively because we are Sunderland, as uh, you know, I don't want to sound big headed or blow me on trumpet, or have you, but that is the case. Um, so, in this upcoming transfer window, is there anyone in particular that has caught your eye who you think, you know, realistically as well, uh, I would like to see us go for? For me, I'll put one out there, and I think we should go for Nandule from Blackpool. That, that's an, yeah, he's, a, he's an obvious one. Um, he's he, he's got a, a decent goal scoring record. He is free. Mm. Um, so yes, that would be an obvious one. But then we've got at the moment striker wise, we've got Wyke and Grig. Mm-hmm. Now it looks like Grig is for sale. It looks like Grig wants to go. Um, Nanwe and Wyke, they're both. They're, they're not. Then. They're not similar players, but they are both strikers that do a lot of hard work, mm. but don't have a huge goal return. No. We need, if we are specifically targeting a striker, we need someone who is going to, well, I, I want someone who's going to be the top scorer in League One next season. Of course. That's uh, and Nan Wye would be, given that he'd be free, and if we gave him a two-year contract, he might be worth a million in a year's time. And that's... Really? That's that's good for a start, but that's that's a risk. That's something people do with every free transfer. Think of the amount of free transfer we've had, like Jordi Gomez, Billy Jones. They've all come in for free and left for free. Kieran Westwood, all of those ones. Yeah. But I certainly wouldn't be against Nanwe at all. I'd be happy if we signed him. No. But he's not the type of striker that we're crying out for. We're crying no. out for someone who's going to score the goals, which was supposed to be mm. Will Grigg. And I, I would imagine that by one way or another, he will go this summer and he, yeah. he won't be that man, even though I was adamant he would be when he signed. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it did come out yesterday. I know uh, Phil Parkinson did speak on BBC Newcastle yesterday regarding Will Grigg. And um, I did actually make a video on it uh, yesterday evening. Um, but he did mention uh, that Will Grigg, um, he, he expects him back for pre-season. Um, but the one thing that did surprise me is that Will Grigg hasn't actually moved up to the North East. He's still based where he was before. And if I remember correctly, that was Lancashire, where he was last based. Um, so for me, I think that shows that Will Grigg, originally when he did move to the club, it wasn't really something he wanted to do. Of course, our club kind of forced Wigan's hand with the amount of money that we were throwing at them, three or four million that's been reported. Um, so for me, it doesn't look as though Will Grigg really wanted to be here and he clearly doesn't now. But Phil Parkinson also expects him to be fighting for a place next season. So it's so, sort of what's going on. Are we forcing a player to be here that doesn't want to be here? If that makes sense. Well, pa- Parkinson has to say that he's expecting to be in pre-season. Of course, and, yeah, yeah. Unless he's very close to a transfer, which I'll see unlikely at this stage when no one knows 
when even the new season starts, they're not going to pay an extra month's wages for no reason. Yeah, of course. Um, but this time last year, he was available for £1 million, even though we'd bought him for three, six months earlier. Yeah. Um, and there was a bit of £800,000 that was turned down because it didn't meet the £1 million um, mm. asking price. But in, in terms of him living in Lancashire, I mean, Roy Keane never moved when he was manager. We didn't have any problem with him. It's, oh, that's fair, yeah. It's fair point. I mean, and remember, he, he may well be three nights a week, he, he might well be staying in a hotel in Sunderland or Durham. Yeah, and he's pretty much living here half the time. Maybe he might be staying with one of the other players. Mm -hmm. We, you know, he might, I mean, from Northern Ireland, he might might be staying with, with uh, McLaughlin or um, uh, yeah. uh, uh, Conor McLaughlin or Tom Flanagan. Um, I mean, I'm just guessing at that. I don't really mind that he hasn't moved out. If it was me personally, I'd, I'd like to to do that. But he, he might have his reasons for it. I think this time last year, I still thought he could come good and be yeah. one of those who were the top scorers in League One. This yeah. hasn't worked out right. But yeah, you, you are right that we need yeah. a striker. We would be happy with Nan Rie, but we would need another. In terms right. of a striker, I, we, our, our whole squad massively lacks pace. And Semenyo, yeah. he, he didn't get that many minutes, but God, he was, I think he's the yeah. quickest player I've seen at Sunderland. He was <laughs> I really, really liked him. I know that Parkinson mm. in the position, in the formation he had, he liked to play him in one of the two positions behind the striker. Yeah. I would get Semenyo back on loan if Bristol City will let us. Mm. Uh, I know we prefer a permanent signing than an on-loan signing. Put him as the main striker, because yeah. that pace, in League One, that pace is almost enough. Yeah, absolutely. And with that pace, he's going to get chances. The more chances he gets, his finishing is going to get better. And to be honest, I don't know if his finishing is good, because we never really saw him get a, a proper chance. Yeah. So... I, I, he'd be my first choice in the in the striking department. He'd be my first choice to get him back because yeah. I I really really liked him. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree that pace is something we definitely, need, particularly in the in the final third. Um, I, I don't really think on the top of my head now that Semenyo has gone, there isn't really anyone there that strikes me as a, as a pacey player. I mean, Gooch at times he, he can show it in the final third, but it, Gooch for me is relatively inconsistent. But why I say uh, Nangele, I think he does have a bit of pace. He does have the strength. Maybe not quite as quick as Semenyo. And um, I think people make this uh, sort of comparison with Wyke and Nangele because they are both deemed to be target men. Uh, but really, for me, that frustrates me with Wyke is he's not really a clinical goal scorer. And as a target man, I don't believe he fulfills that role particularly well either, or at least for us, because he's not the biggest of guys. He is only six foot. And we saw, for example, against uh, uh, Bolton, um, who was it? And he, he was getting out jumped by, uh, is it Bridcourt? He, he, was, he was getting beaten in the air time and time again by Bridcourt, who's almost half his size, you know. Mm. So um, for me, I think I, I would massively prefer Nangela, and I don't even necessarily see why, because a target man. Yeah, well, I mean, we, we would need three We would need three strikers. So, I mean, if Grig goes, you could have Nanwie, Wyke and and one other, Semenya or, 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 or someone else. Mm -hmm. um, White, every time White gets going, he seems to get unlucky with injuries. Yeah. Um, I, haven't, I haven't written him off, because I think, actually, if he, if he scored two goals in two games, mm -hmm. then when, when a, chance, a half chance fell to him in the box in the next game, it's likely to go in. At the moment, he seems to be panicking a bit because he's so desperate to score. Yeah. As, as Sunderland fans, you know what we're like, not just Sunderland, but any, any fan in the North East. We, we love hard work and, yeah. and Mike definitely gives that. So he would, I haven't, I haven't written him off yet because no. he's, you can see that he is working his socks off for us. I agreed. I think he's definitely someone who I can see maybe bringing on for the last sort of 10, 15 minutes if we're, maybe trying to strangle a game or, or maybe just see a game out and frustrate d defenders. But um, I do believe we do need a different vocal point. We need to go down a different route um, in the striking department. But m moving on, um, I was going to touch on uh, the Youth Academy recently. Uh, Reed, the head of the academy, has left. And of course, um, on the academy as well, uh, Bali Mumba, it's reported that uh, we've accepted a bid of around 350k from Norwich. And of course, recently, Robson, Ethan Robson has left. He's been let go. What is your thoughts on the academy and the youth setup as a whole right now? 
Well, we're obviously producing very, very good players. They're just not playing for us. Mm -hmm. That's that. That's the problem. I mean, this we've got this Category One academy, and if we wanted to have a low wage bill, we only need eighteen or nineteen senior players, mm -hmm. and then you can have four or five, six players who've come from the academy who are training with the first team. They'll be on the bench sometimes. And throughout the year, they will improve with first team coaches and a bit of first team action and yep. potentially become regulars. So I would put, I, I would involve them more. I think our squad yep. has always been just slightly too big. We've, we've maybe signed a player to sit on the bench yeah. when we could have promoted someone in the academy to sit on the bench because that player would improve and would be on a lot lower wage. Agreed. Um, when we have thrown people in, and said sink or swim, on the ones who come from the academy, none of them have sunk. If you think in the last few years, Lyndon Gooch is shone, yeah. uh, Madger shone, Azoro shone. Now, Madger and Azoro used that as a way to get out, which, which yeah. I understand that's the flip side of it. Uh, I thought Ethan Robson did very well when, whenever he's played for us. Um, I've got high expectations for Elliot Embleton. Yeah, same, big fan. I think he could be a key player next mm. year um, did we did, could we have found more game time for Barley Mumba last season definitely yeah could we have um, found game time for Kimpioka definitely yeah but he's another one that's gone and the worrying thing is we've got these like amazing players Mm -hmm. younger down in the academy who fair enough they'd be too young to play in the first team at the moment yeah. they're going as well and mm -hmm. that is a huge problem and are they going for money if they're going for money can't really help that no. if they're going they can't see a pathway into the first team that is a bigger problem i don't know if that is the case yeah but the academy is producing great players right yeah. that's a positive the negative is they're just not playing for us Absolutely, I, I agree. Um, I think it is just a case of simply managing them a lot better. Uh, for example, like we did touch on Bolly Mumba. He came in, uh, he played, started the first game of last season against Charlton. I thought he played decent. I mean, alongside uh, Luke O'9 in the middle who came off at half-time, didn't have a great game. But I think he stood his own. He played very well in that game. And he, he played bit parts for the opening sort of 10, 15 games. And then he just seemed to disappear and I don't think that was handled particularly well um, with Barley in particular. Uh, and you just hope that in the future they would manage the youngsters a lot better. And like you say, Elliot Embleton, for me, I think he is head and shoulders above quite a few of the players we have within the senior squad right now. And I'd love to see him uh, put somewhere amongst that final third come the beginning of the next season. Well, well, he was involved, but he got injured. Yeah. Um, the season before at Grimsby, I saw him quite a bit at Grimsby the season before. He was amazing. Yeah. And that was League Two. So he's mm -hmm. clearly ready for League One, Absolutely. but he got injured. And I don't know whether, I mean, if Phil Parkinson sticks with this current formation, I don't know whether uh, Embleton goes in as one of the two behind the striker or whether he goes in to the central midfield. I don't know where he sees him. If he changes the formation to either a 4-4-2, yeah. 4 2 3 one or even 4-3-3. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether he's seen as a winger or in the middle. And yeah. I don't know where Parkinson sees him. Yeah. But either way, I would expect him to be involved and actually would expect him mm. to shine. But I, I did, I always like Ethan Robson as well. It's a shame that he's gone. I think, I think mm. the fact that he's got to 23 without becoming a regular and always going out on loan probably meant they thought, all right, he's not going to progress any further. But... I, I would I would have kept him as well personally, but hopefully yeah. Embleton will shine. And, and I forgot Denver Hume as well. He's now, but well, he's been our only left back because Declan John was. I don't know what happened to Declan John. I, I, I refuse to believe he exists, Declan John. Not... <laughs> it must have been it must have been some sort of deal where he was. We had to pay his club for every appearance or something. Yeah, I, I was so thinking. While, that, yeah. So while Hume was fit, there was no point even putting him on the bench because we'd sometimes. Hume would come off and Gooch would go wing back. Yeah, that's from, true. From from behind the striker role would go a left wing back. Mm. Whereas surely Declan John would be on the bench. So there must have been some sort of um 
there must have been some sort of financial reason for that. Yeah, it was a strange one because I was actually quite excited with the, the signing of John because I've seen him elsewhere and he, he does seem like a really good player, particularly for someone or a team in League One. So I was very surprised to see that he didn't get uh, more game time. Um, but yeah, moving on to that, he did actually just touch on a player, uh, Denver Hume, who for me, I was going to ask you who you believe to be Sunderland's player of the season last season. This season just gone, sorry. Um, mine was actually Denver Hume, much the surprise of quite a, a lot of other people because it, I think a lot of people forget that for the first half of the season, we were playing very, very poorly, I, I believe anyway. And I think the only player who was actually dragging us up the field, our only attacking threat, probably the only player who was getting a sort of 7 out of 10 match rating during the game was what was Denver Hume. And for such a young lad, I admired that massively. So for me, my Sunderland player of the season would be Denver Hume. And I would like to ask you who yours would be. Um, well, Hume's, Hume's crossing is excellent, right? So um, he, he deserves credit for that. He, I think he's, he's definitely you know good enough for us and will still improve. I wouldn't have had him as a player of the season, though. I think that would have to be Gucci or Maguire. Yeah. Um, because without them, without them, we would have been mid-table, I think. Yeah. Um, Gucci... Yeah. Gooch gets put all over the pitch and never complains about it. Since he's, I mean, his, his first game for us was on the left wing. He, he often plays left wing or right wing. Number 10, he's played in a deeper role in midfield before. He's been right wing back. He's been left wing back. He only really hasn't been centre back or, or yeah. goalkeeper. Yeah, so right. I think I'll probably just just about edge, edge it to Gooch with, um, with, with Maguire in second place and probably either Power, Max Power or Jordan Willis mm. just, just behind that. Yeah. But, but Hume is definitely... We, we need another, another left-back because we've, we've only ever had one. For yeah. years, we've only ever had one left-back. When it was Van Arnholt, it was only ever yeah, Van Arnholt. Right. It was, it's, it's always only ever been one left-back. I don't know why that is. Um, although I know Tom Flanagan can cover there, but it, it's, it's not the same. No. So, but I, I, I do like Hume, but he... Yeah, but... but Player of the season would be Gooch. Yeah. Okay, no, that's fine. Now, uh, lastly, your... I suppose it's hard to make a prediction for next season, but what would be your goal for Sunderland, obviously, uh, next season? Would it be to win the league? It, well, it has to be to get automatic promotion. Yeah. It has to be. And the thing, whether, whether people like Phil Parkinson or, or not, the fact that we have a manager in place who's going to be who's ended the season and is going to be the manager next season. Yeah. And he's clearly got targets, right? That's the thing. Last year, everything went out the window because there was supposed to be a, a takeover was so close and it didn't happen. Yeah. So any transfer, any transfers went out the window. Yeah. This year, even though the club's up for sale, it looks like Phil Parkinson is being allowed to just get on with it and sign players. Yeah. That's what it, that's what it sounds like to me. Now that does give us a head start mm. because if we were managerless and waiting and waiting because we don't know when the season's going to start, we don't know if there's going to be a second lockdown. If we were waiting and waiting, we we wouldn't we'd be behind everyone else. Yeah. So Phil Parkinson now has the time to build the squad that he wants, mm -hmm. and with that in mind, that head start mm -hmm. should mean that we can not just push for automatic promotion, but get automatic promotion next season. So that, that's 100% the aim. Yeah. It can't be anything less no. for us than Absolutely. automatic promotion. And he's, he's settled at the club now. He'll know everyone that's there who he wants to stay. He, he does know the League One transfer market, so that should yeah. be a head start for us as well. Absolutely. And, and it, but if we get off to a bad start, then he'll, he'll know yeah. there'll be a change because mm -hmm. because it, there would actually be no excuse yeah at least with Jack Ross there was the excuse that there was supposed to be a takeover of course and I, I think with everything that's gone on I think uh, particularly Philip Parkinson is still going to be the manager come the beginning of next season he's already going to be on the back foot and I think only and you know what our fans are like we can we can be the best fans in the world or we can turn on you very very quickly it can happen um, you know, so I think if he gets off to a difficult start, two or three losses from the opening five or six, things can turn sour very quickly. Um, but I think with a good start, um, you get the, the feel-good factor back. I think the 
top two or some other promotion places, it has to be the aim, doesn't it? Yeah, hundred percent. And I, I don't like the. I, I, I hate three at the back. I, I don't like it at all because no. it, it takes a long time to get the team. Because everyone knows how to play four at the back. If it's there's very little difference between four four two and four two three one. I actually think they're the same formation, right? Yeah. So everyone knows how to play those formations. Yeah. And actually, four three three. If you drop the number ten back into central midfield, everyone still knows their role. Yeah. When it's three at the back, it takes a lot of time to learn your role, which I think is why we got off to a bad start last season because that's what Jack Ross was doing. He yeah. picked it up yeah. when he went back to what everybody knows. Yeah. So I, I hope he changes that formation. Otherwise, if we don't get off to a good start, he'll have to either change the formation or he'll change the manager. Mm-hmm. Right? And, and if he can, if, but either, way, either way, he should be able to build a squad build a team that should gel quite quickly because we, we should be able to get these players in in plenty of time before the season starts, which is looking likely to be September. So, I mean, he's got over two months yeah. to get this squad back and, and ready for the start. And I, we should not have a slow start. I don't know whether we'll be able to be allowed in the stadium to watch it. In fact, mm. I would say no. But as everyone says at the stadium alike, that might actually help us because when we go 1-0 down after five minutes... Mm. We get on the players' backs, and we do. Yeah. So it could actually, it could actually be seen as a positive. <laughs> we are, we're very passionate people, Tom. We're very passionate people. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much everything covered, Tom. So I, I do uh, I massively appreciate you coming on. Um, that's a very nice pleasure. Time. Well, thank you very much. So uh, if you guys at home, if you have enjoyed, please hit the like button for me. It'd be massively, massively appreciated. And subscribe to the channel if you're not already, to become a fully-fledged member of the Sarni Army. But for now, you take care and stay jabbing.